What we're doing now is sustainable, and that's why we have the public-private partnerships and commercial, um, commercial capabilities that are coming online. Very good. And the good news for Tom Cruise is he does a lot of his own stunts. Yeah. So in, not, so in zero gravity, he should get hurt a lot no, less, No, I, th right? I think it's going to be super cool. Yeah. You know? And, yeah, it's, yeah. It, and as, as Joe said, it's like this is going to, you know, you want to capture the public imagination, um, have them see cool, cool things happening in real orbit, you know, real space stations. Uh, it's like, I think I'd want to watch that movie, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and it's, it's like, it, it, like I said, you think it was like, this is like, just, this is really just the beginning, because we want to go from, from low Earth orbit, we want to go back to the moon, not, and the moon to stay, have a moon base, like moon base alpha, um, and, and, and have a, you know, build a city on Mars and be a space-faring civilization out there among the stars. This is a super exciting future that I think, it, that's the kind of thing where you, you're like, yeah, let, yeah, can't wait for it to happen, you know? If you can't get excited after listening to you guys, I'd say you need to have your pulse checked. Yeah. <laughs> Elon Musk, SpaceX CEO and Chief Engineer, thank you very much. Thank you. Jim Bridenstine, we appreciate you leading NASA in this time, Administrator for the agency. And we're going to send it back to Marie. All right, thanks a lot, Daryl. We saw in the meantime, uh, while that interview was going on, the hatch actually closed. So that happened a few minutes earlier than we expected, too. Um, our timeline has that happening at T minus an hour and 55 minutes. So a few minutes ahead of schedule uh, right now with hatch close. And you can see the pad teams there just working on things now. Yeah, right now it looks like what they're doing is Oh, what are they doing? So they perform a leak check. There is a mechanism there called a side hatch mechanism. That is what actually closes the hatch and seals it. And what we'll do is perform a leak check on that for a few minutes to make sure that that's nice and tight, that those O-rings are sealed really, really well. And uh, after that, we will install the, ah, uh, yeah, you can see the leak check uh, ground support equipment there in the technician's hands there. And while we're watching this, Leland, I, I mean, we just heard uh, we just heard them talk a lot about inspiring the next generation. And you're a man of many talents. I, I know after um, your flights yourself, you used to head the head of NASA education. I mean, what did that stir up in you? You know, Marie, this what, what Elon said about reigniting the dream of space is so important that we get our young kids thinking about themselves being in these seats. And I I. When I first became an astronaut in 1998, I was riding on the back of a fire truck celebrating John Glenn's return to flight on a space shuttle. And I saw these two little kids, they had on orange pumpkin suits, and when their dad turned them around to point to look at me on the fire truck. And it was almost as though when they saw my face, they started launching into space with rocket fuel because they were inspired, because they saw someone who looked like them. And I think that if we can reignite this dream through SpaceX's launch, through the partnership with NASA, we can get so many more kids to believe in themselves and know that they can be just like Doug and Bob flying on the SpaceX Dragon. Absolutely. I mean, it's... Uh it's really just breathtaking to see them there in their suits now and uh, looking at the screens in front of them. Lauren, I know we, we've talked a lot about the spacecraft. We've heard about that. But for, for folks that maybe are just tuning in, uh, what are they looking at in front of them now? Yeah, so they have three different touch screens in front of them. Uh, overall, that whole uh, assembly there is called the control panel. So you'll have those three LCD touch screens in front of them where uh, they have the displays are showing them um, details on the vehicle's pressure, its temperature, uh, there's audio control. Um, that center screen has the procedures that they're going through today on day of launch. Um, you can also see the, the vehicle's attitude. You can see its velocity, its apogee, its perigee, its inclination, uh, details on the status of the hatch, the thermal control system loops, basically all the cool stuff that helps them have situational awareness of the vehicle. Um, that's displayed on those displays. Um, additionally, there are some actual buttons on that button panel that you see down below. And uh, that some of the things that that allowed them to do is if the crew ever needed to do any sort of manual overrides like that right in the middle, right underneath that center LCD screen, that's the crew's ability to initiate an abort. It's called an abort handle and it's right in the middle where both crew members could use it if they needed to. And the audio controls um, are also on those button panels. When they're not in their suits, uh, there's actually speakers that are coming off of the control panel that allow them to hear mission control, hear the core, hear ISS um, when they're not in their suits where the audio systems are integrated into that. And we see 
We see them using the touch screens now. Leland, what's your take on this? Because this has got to look totally different from what you were looking at during shuttle. Touch screens. <laughs> we had these <laughs> these displays and these buttons, and you know, we we it was it was one of those moments when I'm looking at this now when I had knee boards that had procedures and things on there, and the procedures are now all run in that middle screen, and the malfunctions and the things that you do to mitigate problems with the uh, with the vehicle if something happens, it's all controlled right there with the two of them, and so it's a it's a radical departure from what we did with the shuttle. But it's, again, ushering in this new era of space travel. For post-ingress brief and a check on how that suit air feels about now. And we're going to listen now for an announcement we're ready. about hatch closer. Copy. Well, today we are not tracking any issues on Dragon and F9 currently. Um, for a weather update, the weather line that is overhead, which is what you saw when you were ingressing, is now moving offshore. The next radar return is a cell over Orlando, which is expected to be our decision gate for today, and that is currently eroding. That's uh, good news. Thank you. Copy. And then one additional item, uh, the Cabo, the orbit site, uh, remains as briefed, so no change there. But I do want to make you aware that that is slightly west of Cabo for go weather. Um, so you just want to target the longitude if needed. Okay, Dragon copy, slightly west. Uh, we'll target the longitude, and the, the uh, suit air has cooled off, so we appreciate that as well. Bobby, outstanding. Uh, let us know if you have any questions, and we'll keep you posted as the closeout team completes the leak check. Dragon copy. So what we actually heard was a little bit more discussion about the weather, uh, still looking at things, and if we're about a minute away from an announcement about hatch close, closure. Excuse me. you're just joining us, we're at T minus one hour, 55 minutes and counting, and we're expecting an announcement to confirm hatch closure in just a few seconds. Dragon SpaceX uh, for comm checks with Falcon 9. Go ahead. Okay, uh, we are ready for that at that time, uh, if you are ready. We are ready. All stations up on Countdown Net for Section 54.49, F9 Responsible Engineer, communication check with the crew. Start with the guidance, navigation, and control. Dragon GNC on countdown one, comm check. GNC Dragon, loud and clear. GNC loud and clear, stand by for comm check by the propulsion engineer. Dragon prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop Dragon, loud and clear. Prop, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics, Dragon, we have good loud and clear. Avionics, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the ground segment engineer. Dragon, ground segment on countdown one, comm check. Ground segment, Dragon, loud and clear. Ground segment, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control and countdown one, comm check. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. 
Dragon, Chief Engineer on Countdown 1, comm check. Bala, Dragon has you loud and clear. Chief Engineer, loud and clear. This completes the F-9 Responsible Engineer comm checks. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to ground. Go ahead, sir. I was just uh, doing a comm check on this loop. Uh, good luck, guys, and buckle in. Thanks to you and the F-19, Bala. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Bala. So we just heard a series of comm checks there, and Lauren, um, I don't know if you want to describe a little bit more about why that's important, and, and we heard the acronym GNC. Um, they said guidance, navigation, and control really quickly, and then went back to the acronym GNC. Can you kind of explain to folks what that means? Yeah, uh, the launch chief engineer, Bala, as you heard them thanking him towards the end, initiated a comm check with all of the different subsystems that... Uh, those those engineers that are on console and those operators today and talking with the crew, making sure that um, they were able to communicate with them bidirectionally and just handing that check off from all of the different stations on console today. That was really, really cool. We obviously don't do that when there's a, a satellite on top of the rocket. So this is the first time for a real flight that we've done that operation. It's very awesome. And now that the hatch is closed, um, a lot of the a lot of the work of this team is is done, but I mean they're they're obviously not finished. They're not ready to leave the white room just yet. You were you were talking to some folks about what's going on in this room now. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, they should be completing the hatch leak check. Uh, that's you sort of pressurize that area between uh, there's two o-rings that are there and uh, we want to pressurize that area see if it holds pressure it's a very very uh, sensitive test very high um, criteria for passing and so once that leak check is shown to be okay and that the capsule or that those o-rings are able to hold pressure uh, what the team will do is they'll go back uh, into that area into that access panel and install what we call the SPEP which this which is the side pressure equalization plug um, once that is plugged you've really closed everything up and when the crew splashes down what they'll actually do is pull that plug to equalize pressure across the hatch so that you don't cause the hatch to buckle due to a pressure or sorry the hatch or the the capsule the weldment any of the vehicle to buckle due to a pressure different differential so they should be adding that plug and then they'll cover up that side hatch access panel with the tps panel or thermal protection system panel close it up and that'll make sure it stays safe on ascent and now, obviously, we're looking at a view from the outside of the top of Falcon 9 yeah, and Crew Dragon. Can, we can confirm a good side hatch leak check. All right. Dragon copies, good leak check. And we just heard confirmation of a good leak check. If you're just joining us, you're looking at the Falcon 9 rocket with Crew Dragon sitting on top. Inside that capsule on top are NASA astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. And we are inside of two hours until liftoff, if the weather holds up. There's another stunning aerial view of the crew access arm extended out towards Crew Dragon. That is the final path that the astronauts took to climb aboard Dragon before they strapped into their seats and the hatch closed. And no doubt Bob and Doug are focused on the mission ahead, but 
you know, we, we also heard um, the administrator and Elon Musk talking about how they've been kind of jovial and joking around. And, and Leland, you, you kind of mentioned to me uh, during that segment that that's really important. It really is, Marie. When we were in the vehicle uh, after we got to this point when the hatch was closed, we were all <laughs> going back to those moments of our training, you know, when we were going through, you know, asset and entry training on the shuttle and just different phases of flight that we would be going through. And we would think about some of our instructors who got us there. You know, in our crew notebooks, we would have names of people that were very impactful in making sure that we were perfect in our in our training. And um, and that looks like a view of Air Force One flying near launch pad 39A for a special guest to have a special view of the astronauts on the launch pad. President Trump uh, on board making his way to Kennedy Space Center to hopefully view a launch at 433 this afternoon. And there they are in view of the launch pad. So no doubt he's looking at the window, looking out the window at Bob and Doug on the pad. That's uh, got to be an amazing sight to see from on board Air Force One. And we are at T minus one hour, 46 minutes, 22 seconds and counting from launch. And guys, the last time we, we actually did a little bit of research when we found out uh, that the president was coming, the last president to witness a launch from here at Kennedy Space Center was Bill Clinton. That was back in October 1998 for STS-95. So it's been a minute. Okay, um, and we are about 56 seconds away from the, oh, no, we're not. We have an hour and 56 seconds away. Never mind. Instead, we are uh, one hour and 45 minutes away from launch. And Tahira, you are there with the social teams. I bet you are seeing some excitement on all the things we just saw on the screen there. Hey, Lauren. I mean, like you said, things are really ramping up on social media right now, especially seeing that hatch close and also just watching this flyover happen. We are up to 1.7 million viewers across all of our social media channels. And let's check out what people are saying on Twitter right now. So it looks like we've got more creativity still going on. Some people are crying with pride in Houston. Feel it. We even have Elizabeth Banks, who from the Hunger Games, that's awesome. We have more just good luck and well wishes for Bob and Doug across the nation. This has been a constant online today, which is so great to see. More just future astronauts and kiddos getting excited. We even have the band Bastille tuning in for launch. This is awesome. And just looks like more people standing by to witness this historic launch today. And so, guys, on top of what's being said on social media, we've also got a lot of well wishes from everyone across our country showing us what today means in their creative way. So let's take a look at that video. I am so ready to launch America. Wow, I mean, guys, just look at everybody excited for today's launch. If that doesn't get you pumped, like, come on, let's go. We even got to see astronaut Snoopy in there, which is a personal favorite of mine. I actually have my lucky Snoopy pin here. You probably can't see it, but he is literally my spirit animal.
Anyways, guys, get excited. The time is almost here. And with that, let's toss back to Lauren at Kennedy. Lauren. <laughs> Thanks, Tahira. Tahira likes the Snoopy. I like the little girl doing the worm, Leland. She wasn't doing the meatball. She was doing the worm. <laughs> There's someone out there doing the meatball, I'm sure. <laughs> I want to know what that looks like. No, I, I don't. <laughs> I'm not, I don't. <laughs> Clearly, this is capturing, capturing the attention of people all across the country and the world. So please continue to join the conversation by using the hashtag Launch America across Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And we've had the opportunity to share with you a lot about the SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle the crew is sitting in right now, a lot about the crew themselves and the significance of today as the official return of human launch capability to American shores. And now we want to turn our attention to where the crew is going, the International Space Station. And for that, let's take you to Mission Control in Houston. Gary? Thank you, Marie. The International Space Station is an incredible facility whose construction, operation, and ongoing science, all these efforts have been made possible by an unprecedented international collaboration. So to tell us more about the space station, we have International Space Station Chief Scientist Kurt Costello with us. Kurt, welcome. Gary, thank you. It's an amazing day to be here to talk to you about this historic launch to the ISS. It really is. Now, many viewers may not realize that there is a laboratory that's the size of a football field, 250 miles above the Earth, and that it's been there for nearly 20 years conducting revolutionary science. Can you share with us more about what the space station is and what it's accomplished so far? Sure, Gary. Over those 20 years, we've conducted over 3,100 experiments on board this space station. Those 3,100 experiments have been done by over 4,100 investigators and represent the work of over 108 regions and countries. The work going on on the space station is not only there to help us with our exploration goals for how to go further into space, but also to bring back benefits for Earth and to produce a commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. All three of these um, objectives, along with the international cooperation that it took to build such an amazing laboratory in space, are great examples of the objectives of the ISS program. Kurt, we know that today's mission is critical to providing us with a steady cadence of operational flights. But why is it so important for us to have this capability from a research perspective? That's a great question. Today's test flight brings us to the beginning of the commercial crew program, a commercial crew program which will raise our occupancy on the U.S. segment of the space station to four astronauts. And that fourth astronaut comes as a real premium to doing research on the space station. The tasks don't get particularly um, more intensive to do systems and maintenance, so that fourth astronaut that time becomes dedicated to performing more science. In fact, enough time that it will essentially double the amount of crew time we have to perform experiments on board station. The return to U.S. soil also brings us the ability to return samples more quickly and get human samples back down to the ground more quickly as well. Kurt, you're talking about all this great research, you're talking about uh, scientific experiments, but what would you say to someone who's watching this and thinking, this isn't relevant to me, I'm never going to space, I don't do science, what do you say to those people? Well, again, one of the focuses is on the ISS benefits for humanities. And for all of us who've been stuck at home during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we've been wondering, wouldn't it be nice to have more bandwidth? Why does the internet slow down? Some of the research we're doing on board Space Station, particularly into Zeblan optical fiber, is using the fact that we don't have sedimentation in a microgravity environment to develop new materials that will help us build more uh, perfect fiber optic cables, which will allow us for better bandwidth and lower cost in implementing uh, networks here on Earth. And then if you're not really a tech geek, <clears throat> maybe your interests lie more in human health. And then we have multiple experiments going on to help us develop new drugs, new treatments on board the ISS. Pharmaceutical companies are uh, working on methods that allow us to crystallize uh, proteins in space in a more purified and more standardized method. And this could lead to monoclonal antibody suspensions that we can treat through injection instead of a painful infusion. 
We also are developing uh, studies into uh, our capability to produce tissues and uh, organs in space. Again, because you don't have sedimentation, there's a capability there to produce more uh, realistic tissues uh, that can someday possibly be used to prevent human disease. Now, Kurt, I know they have some cargo going up with them, but I understand they plan to bring some science back. That's right, Gary. A lot of their cargo going up with them are crew supplies and EVA supplies to support them if they have to do EVAs on board. But the cargo they'll be bringing down is science, and it comes from across the spectrum. We have uh, student experiments in seeds that will be returning with the, uh, the Crew Dragon. Uh, we'll, we also have a number of experiments that are dependent on their samples returning in frozen lockers on board the SpaceX Dragon uh, to be able to do the science there. Those include rodent research tissues from the National Lab Rodent Research 17 mission, and also our veggie experiments, which are experiments in growing plants in space that will be needed when we go to more distant uh, locations like the Moon and Mars. International Space Station Chief Scientist Kirk Costello, thank you so much for your time. Let's hear now from one of the next astronauts to fly to station on a Crew Dragon, talking with Marina Jerika. Marina. Thank you so much. I am so honored to be a part of today's momentous launch. My guest is no stranger to the International Space Station and will return there for the first time in nearly a decade for his third space flight with the Crew-1 launch expected later this year. Having logged 177 days in space from flights on the Space Shuttle Discovery to the Soyuz, JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi will have spent more time in space than any of his other crewmates. It is my pleasure to Welcome him here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Soichi. Honjitsu wa arigato gozaimasu. Wow, that's wonderful. Marina, how are you doing? Thanks for having me today. This is uh, wonderful. Today we are celebrating the launch, so uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for being here with us. I am sure you have felt the excitement for today's launch, Soichi, and you will be on the next Crew Dragon flight after this one. Are you excited to launch from Kennedy Space Center again, and how are you preparing for this new vehicle? Yes, definitely we are excited to go back to Kennedy Space Center. My first space flight was from Kennedy Space Center on the Space Shuttle Discovery. That was 15 years ago, but my, my memory is still fresh. I still feel the vibration of the launch, the same launch pad of 39A that the demo to go up and the same launch pad that we will go up uh, as a crew one. And uh, our crew is getting ready for the final uh, training phase, which will come uh, in the coming weeks and uh, the mood is really high and we are ready to go up. And as you know, the International Space Station and space exploration is an international effort. How do you feel representing the Japanese Space Agency once again on the ISS? Well, I think the, the strengths of the International Space Station is the diversity of the, all the participating countries and the adding of diversity is definitely gives a rigidity to the program. And the same applies to our crew, our crew one. Our crew one, uh, we are four of us, but uh, quite a different background, They're quite a different uh, ethnicity, and uh, definitely the diversity is the key word of our success to the crew one. And I'm sure it will be very successful. What are you looking forward to once you get back to the ISS? Well, this will be my third uh, visit to the International Space Station. I'd like to see the things uh, my colleagues uh, keep saying, hey, you got to visit the space, space Station again because it's getting more comfortable, more roomy, and uh, I cannot wait to go back to my sleep station after 10 years. And nothing beats that view, does it? Oh, definitely. Uh, my last flight, we actually installed a big window called the cupola, and uh, that was a big hit, obviously. This is uh, the number one uh, leisure time for astronauts, and um, I'm ready to shoot as many photos as I can this time as well. Amazing. I will look forward to seeing those photos. I'm sure you remember exactly what it feels like in these moments right before a launch. What do you think Robert Benkin and Douglas Hurley are feeling right now as they prepare to head to the ISS? Well, uh, Doug and 
Bob's uh, special uh, veterans, they know the drill. They have, they have launched, uh, they, they experienced the launch before. So I think they're pretty relaxed. And uh, so far through my training, I learned that most of the, uh, the steps before the launch is quite similar to what we have in the space shuttle days. So, uh, you know, different suit, different vehicle, but uh, all the necessity steps uh, to, to go up into the capsule should feel similar. So I'm pretty sure they are relaxed. Of course, they are very excited. I'm sure they are. Gokatsu yakuo, oinori shiteimasu. Honjitsu wa arigato gozaimashita. Thank you so much, Soichi, for joining us today. Oh, Marina, you are so good. Domo arigato. And uh, we all both enjoyed the beautiful lunch today. Thank you very much for having me. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good luck with your launch later this year. And as the excitement builds towards launch, I will send it back to you. Thank you, Marina. I now have the distinct pleasure of being joined by one of NASA's record-setting astronauts and a recent resident aboard the International Space Station, Christina Cook. Christina, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Dan. Christina, we're coming up on 20 years of continuous human presence on the space station, and you were one of those humans. What's it like to see a new milestone like this launch unfold after so much history already? So much history indeed. Um, it is really just such a testament to NASA. Not only are we pushing the boundaries of knowledge and discovery and exploration, but we're pushing the boundaries on how we accomplish that mission. We're bringing in commercial partners. We're fostering a space economy. So we're making sure that we're always pushing forward, always taking that next step. I think it's such a privilege to be part of an organization that recognizes if we're not actually making steps and in innovating every single time we do this, then we're not truly answering humanity's call to explore and to push those boundaries. Christina, I know Bob and Doug are veterans themselves, but what advice do you have for Bob and Doug, given your experience as a long-duration station crew member? Well, being able to live on board the International Space Station and work there is just such a privilege. You know, you're a steward of this amazing laboratory that's bringing so many benefits down to Earth and also learning how we can push farther into the universe. So it is quite an honor, and I think that's the main thing about how it feels to be up there for a long duration. You know, in terms of advice, um, Bob and Doug have been great mentors for me. They've given me advice for so many years. It's strange to be the one who could be in a position to offer them anything. But I would say that as, you know, shuttle flyers, they used to participate in missions that were really, really intense, go, go, go all the time. Long duration space flight is more of a marathon than a sprint. So I would tell them to take that moment, enjoy it, and you know, really welcome the opportunity to have part of your mission be taking it all in and sharing that with the people that got you there. Thanks again, Christina. Always a pleasure to hear from you and fantastic words. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, my pleasure. So once again, Bob and Doug, once Bob and Doug arrive at the station, um, They'll be greeted by astronaut Kiss Chris Cassidy, but before we do that, let's toss to a briefing. Hello everyone, I'm astronaut Chris Cassidy, commander of Expedition 63 on board the International Space Station, flying 250 miles above the Earth. Like you, I'm excited about today's launch and the possibilities it will bring to America and to the world. But also, I'm very excited that two close friends will be arriving and joining the crew. I had the privilege of flying with Doug Hurley on both of our first shuttle missions back in 2009. Together, we came to the International Space Station and helped construct the amazing facility that it is today. 
Although this will be my first mission with Bob, it was my honor to follow him as the chief of the office when he left back in 2015 to begin training for this amazing mission. Personally, I've been very fortunate to fly in two different spacecraft. Launching from America on the shuttle, and most recently launching from Kazakhstan in the Soyuz. But I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that we're once again launching Americans from the coast of Florida. And finally, here's a story I'd like to share with you. Back in 1981, John Young and Bob Crippen launched on Space Shuttle Columbia, the very first space shuttle flight, marking the last time we flew Americans on a brand new vehicle. 434, Mike, Roger. With them, they flew an American flag, representing America's technical prowess. Roger roll, Atlanta. 30 years later, that same flag was flown to the International Space Station. This flag remains here today, waiting for Bob and Doug. Our flag means so many things to our country, and this small piece of America represents what we'll be able to achieve together. We'll never stop exploring. And so Bob and Doug can take this very special flag home to Earth, where it awaits its next journey to the cosmos. In a few years, the first Orion crew will take this flag with it around the moon. All of this starts today. I'll be watching outside the window, along with everyone else in America and around the world. I can't wait to look out the window and see my friends on close approach. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and go Bob and Doug. I'll see you soon. And that was a very special message from NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy. Right now, the lone American aboard the International Space Station, so he will be ready and waiting to welcome Bob and Doug uh, when they arrive tomorrow, if liftoff happens today, uh, a little uh, later tomorrow morning. The countdown now stands at T minus one hour, 25 minutes, 54 seconds, and counting until launch. And we'd like to share with you just how much has happened here at Kennedy Space Center since the last time we had a crew on the pad launching from here. As you can imagine, the end of the shuttle era was a bittersweet moment for many people across this spaceport. But in the end, we knew we were striving for this day, and here we are. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center's Deputy Director Janet Petro on the comeback we've seen across Florida's space coast. She's with Daryl Nail now at OSB2. Daryl? Yeah, thank you, Marie. Janet, uh, you were just telling me you were there at the crew walkout. Um, tell me a little bit about what you saw between the astronauts and their families. So it's uh, very historic. It was very uh, emotional. So when Doug and Bob first came out of the uh, doors, you know, of course, a cheer went up from everybody. You know, the vice president was there, Elon was there, uh, the crew families was there, and of course, uh, uh, Bob, myself, and the rest of uh, the center leadership was there to cheer them on. Um, but then, the, you know, when they came out and uh, then they went to the families and uh, Bob Benkin said virtual hug and he, he shouted out a virtual hug and he did this motion and of course his uh, his child also did that uh, virtual hug and so I guess that's the uh, tradition of doing a virtual hug with mm -hmm. the uh, families and then they um, uh, you know then they walked and got in the Tesla um, either side and the family walked right up to the uh, window of the Tesla and were talking you know having a private last moment with their um, with their father uh, hand on the window it was very emotional I had tears in my eyes I don't know how many other people had tears in their eyes, but it was it was really a special emotional moment, and everybody was of course wishing them well. Um, a lot of a lo I love yous, a lot of uh, Godspeeds, a lot of Ad Astra, you know, take mm -hmm. care, all of that. So it was very special. That, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and in the context of why it's so important, Janet, you remember, you've been here since 2007. Seven. Yep. You were here in 2011 when Shuttle Atlantis came to wheel stop. I've, I've talked to my uncle and father who worked out here. You know, layoff notices went out like the next day when the shuttle came to a stop. Um, it was a very sad time. Bob Cabana, the director here, called, called it depressing. Uh, 
Tell me about that time and how far we've come. Yeah, so uh, as you as you note, it was the end of a very iconic program. You know, a lot of people had spent their entire career uh, working on the space shuttle program. So 135 flights, um, all of them launching from Launch Complex 39, many from 39A, where we're going to be launching from today, and then returning back. You know, at the shuttle landing facility, those two iconic sonic booms was something that all along the Space Coast, people really uh, resonated with. It really felt in their hearts and looked forward to. So it was a it was a very sad time, but I will tell you that 30-year program we had planned for it. Um, the the workforce was incredible. You know there was there was a lot of people who, as I said, spent their entire career here and they wanted to safely fly that shuttle out and then they retired. There was also another large uh, group of people that just wanted to put on their resume that they had been privileged to work on the space shuttle. So the the workforce I was uh, incredibly proud of because they were um, resilient, they were dedicated, they were committed to safely flying out that shuttle. They didn't skip any steps. And regardless, as you said, that they knew they were getting their layoff notices. Uh, I think it landed on a Wednesday. They were getting their layoff notice on a Friday. They were in it till the end to make sure we safely flew it out. And of course, you know, we had 14,000 uh, workers out here then, mm -hmm. um, uh, which we have uh, a lot fewer here today. Um, and of course, our guest operations, you remember those last shuttle flights, everybody around the country wanted to be a part of that experience. And we at the center really leaned forward to maximize how many people we could get both on site uh, and never mind how many people were lined up at the beaches all along the river mm -hmm. to watch that uh, last flight. And of course, today with COVID, unfortunately, we weren't able to have any um, on site guest operations, which was pretty sad for this historic flight. But I'll bet that there's a ton of people watching uh, from the beaches or from even their TV as we uh, launch here today. I'm sure there is. And a uh, tribute to your leadership and Bob Cabanas as well, uh, getting things turned around here as a multi-user spaceport, getting the commercial entities in here. We appreciate all that you've done to make that happen. Janet Petro, pre appreciate you being here. Thank you, Daryl. All right, Marie, we'll toss it back to you. All right, thanks, Daryl. And as NASA and SpaceX have worked for years to get to this moment, today's mission opens the door to an entirely new era in human spaceflight, not only for astronauts, but someday for the general public as well. From the beginning, it has been our mission at SpaceX to help make humanitary, wow, humanity, a multi-planetary species. And today's mission is an important step towards that goal. The key to opening up space access for people like you and me is reusability. Without it, traveling to space is just far too expensive for the average person to do. Imagine how expensive a flight from LA to New York would be if you had to throw the plane away after a single trip. A the, lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That ticket would cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and almost no one could ever afford to fly. Both the Dragon spacecraft and the Falcon 9 rocket are designed to be reusable, which not only improves the reliability of the vehicles in that they're flight proven again and again, but it also drives down cost. This is essential to enabling not just a handful of people, but rather hundreds of thousands of people to get out there and to explore the moon, Mars, beyond. And I, for one, it is my dream to visit Jupiter's ocean moon, Europa. Leland, you're one of the lucky Earthlings that's had the opportunity to get off the planet and go explore. Where would you like to go next? You know, Lauren, I think I would like to go to Mars and, you know, be there for you know, a, a year, about a year each way, and then a year on the Martian surface. But the one condition I would have to have, my pups would have to go with me. <laughs> because it's about exploring new places, but taking your family with you. You know, we have these crewmates that are people that you get to know and love, you know, over a course of training. But it's nothing like having your family with you. And I think that's something that we're going to be seeing in the future, people living and working on other planets as a family. I think Absolutely. there are a lot of people who want to see your dogs with you in space. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw, we've saw we seen them in, a, in an official portrait. I know that the dogs came in with you to take a picture in your space suit in, back in the day. Yeah, we there kinda, it is. Well, we kind of oh, snuck yeah. them in, uh, you know, no, no dogs allowed at NASA. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had their moment. They sure did. And uh, knowing that the opportunity to fly to space as a private citizen or a private dog maybe one day is right around the corner, uh, we have a new poll question on Twitter for you. So if you were given the opportunity, would you travel to space? Let us know and we'll share the results a little bit later. 
All stations coming. All right. Well, there is not a lot of cargo. Chief Engineer Technical Pole for oh. Launch Escape Arming and Propellant Loop. All right. Now, while there's not a lot of cargo in today's mission, Dragon is carrying two special payloads, aside from Bob and Doug, of course. The first is a series of custom art pieces entitled Humankind by Los Angeles artist Tristan Eaton. These indestructible double-sided paintings are made from gold, brass, and aluminum, and they celebrate how far humanity has come as well as how far we still have to go. It includes a beautiful homage to the Saturn V rocket as well as a nod to Bob and Doug's current ride to space. You can find more images and information about these pieces on SpaceX's social channels. Next, in the spirit of inspiring the next generation of explorers, we wanted to celebrate the class of 2020, from kindergarten all the way through graduate school. SpaceX and NASA invited students from around the world to submit their photo to fly on America's first human spaceflight in nearly a decade. Each graduate's photo was used to create a mosaic image of the planet Earth, which we printed, and is being flown aboard Bob and Doug's flight on the Crew Dragon spacecraft. We received nearly 100,000 photos. So thank you and congratulations to all the world's graduates. I am so proud of what we're doing today. And I think about regular people flying in space on a SpaceX rocket one day. When I first went to space, I thought my primary task of installing the Columbus Laboratory would be my aha moment, but it was when Peggy Whitson invited us over to the Russian segment to have a meal. She said, you guys bring the rehydrated vegetables, we'll have the meat. And <laughs> we're, we're, you know, we're doing this, having this meal, and it's with African-American, Asian-American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander breaking bread at 17,500 miles an hour going around the planet every 90 minutes. And when I think of that perspective shift that I got looking out the window, flying over my hometown, flying over Leo's hometown in Paris, flying over uh, Yuri's hometown in Russia, it brought us all together as a civilization. And I think that's what spaceflight does for us. The more people that have the opportunity to go to space will feel like it's, a, it's an international family of people working together for the good of humanity and all humankind. Absolutely, and it, it's exactly what that piece of art was all about. Yeah. And following today's mission, we will be one step closer to a future where we can all have that experience. We can all have that orbital perspective and the ability to explore new worlds. In just over an hour from now, Bob and Doug will be the first people to launch on an American vehicle in almost a decade. For the team at SpaceX, it's really hard to put into words how honored we feel about the trust that Bob, Doug, and NASA have put into our team to carry out this critical mission. I worked on Crew Dragon for, for two years, and I can just imagine what all of my friends and colleagues are thinking right now as they sit in anticipation and excitement for what's to come. Absolutely. And speaking of those who have carried the hopes and dreams of science and exploration, we have a few shout outs to share with you from some big fans of NASA and SpaceX. Wow, we're making history again. The NASA program. I am there with you guys in spirit. Bob, Doug, good luck. I know you'll be fine. I'll be watching and got everything crossed, arms, legs. I'm tied in a knot. Can't wait for you to get back safely. This is the first time a US built rocket has taken people into space in nine years. It's quite an accomplishment. So for us at the Planetary Society, more rockets means more exploration. More people in space means more exploration. More countries involved in the endeavor of spaceflight means more exploration. This is how we know the cosmos and our place within it. So congratulations, SpaceX. Here's wishing your team and the crew especially a safe journey and the joy of discovery. Let's go. And a big thanks to William Shatner and Bill Nye for those well wishes. And while we're keeping an eye on the pad, we want to bring in NASA astronaut Rex Walheim. If that name rings a bell, it's because he flew three space shuttle missions to the International Space Station, including the final one by Atlantis, STS-135. He was one of the last four people to ascend the tower at Pad 39A and head to space. And he currently is Deputy Director of Safety and Mission Assurance at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Rex Walheim, thanks for joining us. Uh, you and Leland actually flew together. 
Hey, Rex we dog. Did. Great flight. <laughs> really enjoyed flying with Levi. Oh. Hey, old dog. <laughs> Rex, you flew on the final shuttle mission, we said STS-135, with Doug, in fact. What's it like seeing him in Crew Dragon right now? It's great. This is what we've been looking forward to. You know, after the uh, end of the shuttle program, you know, it was a very important time. We wanted to transition to this commercialization of space flight to allow these commercial companies to uh, take our astronauts to and from the space station. So in the nine years we've had since uh, we last landed on Atlantis, we've really worked hard for that. We've worked with our SpaceX partners and our Boeing partners, and here we are. Today's the day. We're taking that first step uh, in this new era. What do you remember most about launch day for STS-135? I think it was just you, you felt the, the weight of it. Uh, this, the space shuttle was a story program, 135 flights, and thousands of people had poured their lives into this program to launch probes to the planets, to launch the Hubble Space Telescope, and then, of course, to build the International Space Station. So you knew the incredible accomplishments of this program, and so you wanted to finish strong. And then when it finally became uh, launch day, you'd finished the study, and you'd worked really hard, and now it was time to kind of soak it in. And I think that's what Bob and Doug are doing right now. They're sitting on the vehicle, talking to each other, listening to the sounds, and uh, feeling the vibrations as it starts up. And uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a great uh, great experience for them. Hi, Rex. What is your take on private astronauts going to space? I think it's great. I think the the more we can do to commercialize space to to make access easier, the better we are. And I think uh, that's uh, part of this whole program. You get the cost down, then more people can afford it. And you get the cost down, and you can do more things in space, more science, more research. And uh, uh, it is a transformative experience to fly in space, and I wish more people could see that. Uh, when you look out on the planet, like Lehman was talking about earlier, with your crewmates from different countries all around the world, it gives you different perspective. It gives you a perspective that we're all crewmates on this planet Earth. And we kind of get that now with the pandemic. We understand that we're all in this together. And uh, that's what the space program does, and I want to see more people get a chance to uh, see the Earth from that vantage point, and I think it'll bring us all closer together. Okay, Rex, a very serious question here. The worm or the meatball? <laughs> Leland, I saw you dissing the, the worm earlier. How can you do that? The worm is awesome. I'm so glad to have the NASA worm insignia back. It's great. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much, Rex. We appreciate you. And as we watch um, the as we watch uh, Bob and Doug there in the capsule, uh, we are an hour, 10 minutes, 57 seconds and counting from launch, and we're going to send it over to Hawthorne for an update. Jesse? Thanks, Marie. We're just an hour and 13 minutes away from well, launch, and that. things are really getting ready to pick up here. Since arriving at the spacecraft, Bob the and Doug robot. were helped by our closeout engineers to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air, pressurized nitrox, and a commu communication link to Dragon systems. They conducted leak checks, which were successful, and communications checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person who will speak to them directly throughout the, the entire mission, as well as the launch director in Florida. This is where they are checking their comm path through both ground stations and tra the tracking and data relay satellites that we'll use to talk to the crew the entire way to the station. That's right, and after those suit checks were complete, the closeout team was able to seal up the hatch, which also got its own leak check, and we confirmed that it was good to go. The closeout team at this point has already departed the area Field around the started. pad. They're about 25 minutes ahead of their schedule, and right now weather operators are kicking off their final check on wind speeds at the pad, which are going to be used, and they're really important for that final go-no-go -go for launch. Before we get to that final go, no go, various teams at both NASA and SpaceX are going to do some internal go polls, just making sure conditions are good with Falcon 9, the Dragon, the crew, the range, and the space station before the final go is given. So let's check back in with Houston real quick for a status on the team there supporting the space station on their readiness for launch. In Mission Control Houston, led by Flight Director Zeb Scoville, has been pulled, and we're go for launch. All systems on board the station that are required to be healthy for the mission are reported good, and we're standing by. Station conditions are normal, and the trajectory is will meet right up with the orbiting complex as planned. Chris Cassidy aboard the International Space Station is finishing up some tasks, going into his pre-sleep period, and will be able to watch the launch of Bob and Doug. 
Mission Control Houston will largely be in a monitor mode for the first 18 hours of the flight, with the team here really jumping into the mix tomorrow when Dragon gets in range of the International Space Station, and we begin integrated operations. So I'll send it back. Everything's green on our board from the International Space Station. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and Godspeed to Bob and Doug. All right, thank you, Gary. If you are just now joining us, you picked a really good time because we are one hour, eight minutes and counting away from launch. And this is our coverage for this mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Liftoff time still holding for 4.33 p.m. Eastern, tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon, and we're still waiting for that weather to hopefully cooperate. We're still tracking a few things like precipitation and flight through clouds. We're hoping that clears within the next 20 minutes or so. Over the last three hours, our crew members, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin, donned their SpaceX suits in the historic crew quarters suit-up room and made their way out to launch pad 39A. They walked out of the crew quarters building just as every astronaut to fly from this spaceport has done since Apollo 7. They were transported to the pad where the crew now on board the Crew Dragon spacecraft and we're continuing to get views of them inside that cabin live. Today is a historic launch. It will be the first time a commercially built spacecraft will launch people into orbit and the Stage first one, time since the U.S. has sent people to the space station from American soil since 2011 with the retirement of the space shuttle program. Over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch, have Bob and Doug arm the launch escape system and begin and fueling Falcon 9. Launch is set for 4.33 p.m. Eastern. This will include a 12-minute flight to orbit and then a 19-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Today's mission is the culmination of years of work between the teams at SpaceX and at NASA. Demo 2 is going to be an end-to-end -end flight test. We're going to start with launch today, go all the way to docking with the space station, and then when Bob and Doug come home, splashing down in the Atlantic. And this is going to be the final test for NASA to certify SpaceX for regular crew flights to the space station. And we've been hearing a little from the crew on board Dragon, which, is, which they are currently strapped into their seats, as you can see on your right screen. Uh, they're already through their seats or they're they've already been strapped into their seats and through communications and leak checks they're able to follow all the milestones Dragon still SpaceX ahead on those displays just above them that you can see there go ahead yeah we're gonna equalize the pressures in the common manifolds just to raise them a little bit so we will be momentarily cycling the tank isolation valves i uh, just wanted to uh, let you know for awareness. Just wanted to take a pause to listen into the nets. Okay, we appreciate that, Jay. So they'll be getting insight into all of the Dragon and Falcon 9 systems as we proceed towards launch. At T minus one hour and seven minutes, let's check in with John Insprucker for a status update on both of those vehicles. What's the update, John? Well, the good news is we've had a smooth countdown this afternoon. SpaceX team is working no technical issues on either the Falcon 9 or the Dragon spacecraft. For the Falcon 9, operators have complete, or well, they are actually still in work, they're going to complete in a few minutes, propulsion checkouts that are being done on both the first and second stages. The team will be assessing their launch readiness with a final go, no go poll. That'll come at T minus 45 minutes, and that'll be followed by propellant loading starting at T minus 35 minutes. Now, earlier today, Dragon operators performed a series of checkouts of Dragon's flight systems. The spacecraft is also currently go for launch. Our NASA crew, astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, that you can see inside the Dragon capsule on the right-hand side of the display, they are currently going through uh, the various screens, simple checks, their uh, hatch is closed, suit leak checks are complete, comp checks are good. The next major event for Dragon is going to be retract of the crew access arm that you can see on the left monitor up alongside the Dragon capsule. That's going to happen somewhere between 45 and 42 minutes before liftoff. Now, the big one right now is the range. The range is currently red for launch from historic pad 39A. Now, the air in the sea space is clear, and the worldwide network of ground stations, as well as the tracking and data relay satellites, they are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. But the range is red for the weather. We recently did clear, we went green for lightning, but we are still violating several constraints. Rain, accumulus crowds, 
Uh, field mills, which is uh, essentially you can tell that the atmosphere is energized around the launch site. We are expecting that we'll possibly clear that. We're going to hear a weather briefing at one hour with the expectation that those conditions may clear shortly afterwards and allow us to move into propellant loading. Also, we've been releasing balloons. What we're seeing at the upper altitudes is conditions look good for Falcon 9 with Dragon. No concerns have been expressed by the GNC uh, guidance team right now. Now, as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch window at 4.33.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time or just past 33 minutes after the upcoming hour. So we get one chance at it today. But currently, T minus one hour and three minutes, just passing that. Uh, Falcon 9, Dragon are go. The range is ready to support, but now we're waiting on the weather as we've been expecting all afternoon. Thanks, John. We've got an extensive history now of flying Falcon 9 from the Florida coast and just last year completed a test run of the mission that we're less than an hour from beginning here today. Yeah, that, the purpose of that mission was to demonstrate Dragon's capability to safely and reliably fly to and from the International Space Station. The success of Demo 1 was a really exciting moment and it paved the way for today's mission where we are just moments away, hopefully if we get that weather, from flying U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time since 2011. Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. As I mentioned earlier, SpaceX has successfully completed 21 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, including 20 trips to the International Space Station. Not only have we conducted thousands of hours of testing, we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. Much of what was learned with the cargo Dragon was leveraged in Dragon the design SpaceX of this vehicle. Cycling is complete, uh, expected behavior, and wanted to hear if you were able to hear those. We actually did, Jay. We were just uh, making a comment about that. I heard some clicking, and uh, and Bob watched it on the uh, systems display. So, absolutely. Copy all. And that again, right there. That's the crew talking to the core here in. Uh, Hawthorne, California, who's going to be talking to them throughout their ascent uphill today. So they were just doing a quick checkout. Bob and Doug confirmed they were able to hear it. it sounds like everything's still good, so still no issues with Falcon or Dragon. Back to what we were talking through as we're describing these systems. A lot of what SpaceX did with Cargo Dragon has been leveraged into this Crew Dragon. The vehicle is designed to be fully autonomous, which means it can basically fly itself but it also features a full manual override capability if the crew needs to take control in case of emergency. Many of the other enhancements help towards SpaceX's goal of reusability and less refurbishment time between missions. So let's take a closer look at some of these advancements. Standing at almost 27 feet tall from bottom of the trunk to top of the nose cone, Crew Dragon's composed of two main elements. We have the capsule up top, which is designed to hold the crew and any pressurized cargo, and then an unpressurized section known as the trunk on the bottom. And the nose cone at the top of the capsule protects the docking system as well as the guidance navigation control system, or what we call GNC. The nose cone opens for docking and remains attached to the Crew Dragon spacecraft, unlike the previous version of Dragon, that, and that helps towards our reusability Dragon efforts. Dragon SpaceX, we are at T-minus one hour. You are go for section six. When ready, report go for launch. SpaceX Dragon will put uh, section six in work. So the crew just has a couple checks, Copy. and when they are ready for launch, we're going to hear them report to the core that they are go for launch. Continuing to walk you through the Dragon spacecraft, opposite of that nose cone is the trunk. We can see it uh, on the left-hand screen there where it's kind of split right down the middle with the left side black and the right side white. Uh, the trunk provides an attachment point to Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and can carry any cargo uphill. On the outside, one half of the trunk contains a radiator that rejects heat from the active thermal control system into space using SpaceX's new PICA tiling technology. The other half contains solar cells that are used to charge the spacecraft's batteries during flight. Spacecraft. SpaceX Dragon, Bob and I are go for launch. And you heard that call out right Copy. there? Copy, go for launch. Next up will be the go-no-go no go pole at T-minus 45. 
Bob and Doug are go for launch and next step. We're holding in step six decimal five. <laughs> You're hearing it live from the Mets. This is amazing, very exciting. The SpaceX is designed, the spacecraft is designed to accommodate up to seven crew members with modular seats that can be removed and replaced by additional cargo. The seats are made of carbon fiber and will be custom sized for any crew members flying on board. And that control panel that's centered between the pilot and commander seats consists of three touchscreen displays and that just again allows the crew to operate the vehicle and fly it manually but also look at all of their procedures, relative position over the earth, the space station, any alarms, alerts, anything that they could possibly want to do on Dragon is through those touchscreens. <laughs> and lastly, our Super Draco launch escape system is a key safety feature of Crew Dragon, giving the crew the ability to safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit. And that launch escape system was put into work a little bit earlier this year, again, on that in-flight abort test. As we look to the future beyond this test flight, the first operational SpaceX crewed mission for NASA will be a little bit later this year after Bob and Doug come home. NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and Suichi Noguchi of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, were chosen to support this mission being called Crew-1. But today, Doug Hurley is the spacecraft commander for this mission. He previously flew on two space shuttle missions as the pilot on STS-127 and STS-135, which was the final Three, space four, shuttle four, flight. Four Here's a closer look at launch. Doug Hurley. Please review your launch commit criteria. Again, this is uh, to review and confirm no violation of launch commit criteria. We are tracking one issue with uh, yeah, very weather exciting. still. And I think oh, yeah. we'll need to track that ready. all the way down uh, to uh, launch to uh, clear that. This pulls also go for arming and launch escape system and uh, go for propellant load. And this is he on countdown, countdown net reporting that uh, the technical pull was completed. All systems are proceeding. Uh, we're monitoring the weather as LD briefed. We're also looking at a uh, watch item on a hydraulics QD rod ring. Uh, ring pressure will come up at minus 8 minutes 30 seconds, and we'll be able to verify decay rate. No concerns at this time. Everything's reading nominal, uh, but watching that item. Uh, no other constraints on Falcon 9 or ground systems. Stage two, RP-1 bleed is complete. All right, we just crossed the 55 minute mark away from launch. Sitting right next to Doug Hurley, who's closest to your screen, is NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. He's the net, he is the Joint Operations Commander for Demo 2, and Bankin previously flew on two space shuttle missions, STS-123 and STS-130, and also served a tour as Chief of the Astronaut Office. So here's a little bit more about the man who said testing out a brand new spacecraft is an astronaut's dream. When you go through the, the launch day preparations, there's a lot of moments that, that kind of stand out to you. One is the kind of the celebratory piece of it, which is that you're walking out of the suit up room and uh, getting in the vehicle that's gonna take you to the launch pad. When you close the hatch, you know, that's really when Doug and I are in the vehicle and it's our vehicle and you know, we're really in control of the mission uh, at that point. Test pilots, their task proved that man could fly into orbit around the Earth and return live and well to talk about it. 
There's always a, a balance of managing risk as you go forward to execute a test point and figuring out a way to you know, collect the data. We hear a sound, okay, is that sound an expected sound? Or we see a light, is that light an expected light? Um, what's the source of it? Does it sync up with something else that's going on or not? So trying to dissect all of that in real time in your head is, uh, you know, a lot of things happen like that on, a, on launching of a vehicle. From St. Anne, Missouri, he is an Air Force Colonel and flight test engineer. He flew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour twice, introducing NASA astronaut Bob Behnken. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000, uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. It's been uh, uh, really interesting, I think, for both my wife and I to have gone through the process of seeing each other uh, launch in space. I've seen her take that risk and had it be in front of her, and uh, I've done that to her. There's just something different about watching a rocket launch when there are people on board. You feel a little bit differently about the pit of your stomach, and I can only tell you it's multiplied uh, significantly when it's uh, somebody that you know, and then somebody, of course, that's a family member. It's even multiplied more. For me personally, as a spouse, watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years, um, the dedication that he's shown, the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that, uh, you know, that my spouse appreciates, and I love her for that. Really, my role on the Demo 2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team, um, helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this, now there's another capability in the U.S. besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. When is the last time humans launched on a, a new vehicle? Certainly on the, the American side, it's it been several decades. Now we're in a transition time when we've got started. multiple vehicles under development. It's a great time from a, a space exploration time frame just to see all that happening. And it's because of this nurturing of the environment, being able to pull in a, a wider group of people who can contribute towards a human spaceflight. It's just a, it's a super cool time. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. I want to thank the entire Commercial Crew Program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles in the launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. We're just over 49 and a half minutes away from launch of the Falcon 9 carrying Dragon to the space station. Right now, the launch director and the launch team are preparing for a readiness for launch poll. In this poll, the 13 members of the launch team will electronically indicate a go for launch. This is also the go for propellant load. Now, we're going to hear that in a couple of minutes, so while we wait, we are tracking you watching from all over the country. We're seeing large numbers of you logging on or tuning in from coast to coast, as well as around the world. We want to know, is this your first time watching a launch live? If not, how many have you seen before? 
Tell us using the hashtag LaunchAmerica from your favorite social media website. As for me, this isn't my first one. I've seen a lot, but everyone is exciting. Now coming up, we're going to go into a readiness poll, as I mentioned. Currently right now on other nets, the SpaceX launch director is checking to verify the Dragon team is ready and that the NASA launch management team is ready. They'll come back uh, at about T minus 47 minutes with instructions to the SpaceX Falcon 9 team to make their final assessments. Then they log into the procedure. It's a little different than the old days where you would hear a go, 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 you know, position by position all up and down the row. Uh, in this electronic age, everybody just clicks on uh, whether they're go or no go. The launch director will then at T minus 45 minutes summarize the end of the poll and will then provide instructions for the team. At the same time, we will begin getting ready for the crew access arm retraction and we'll show you that on one of the uh, screens that we've got up. Now currently we are continuing to monitor the weather. The weather is still red. It is improving. We're looking at one cell between the radar and the pad. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed that conditions will improve, but we're going to be watching that for about another 15 minutes. So it looks like we're going to be good to begin propellant load once we hear the poles, but we still have to get the uh, final, get the range green so that we can actually do the launch in just 47 minutes from now. Let's listen to the countdown net for a moment. Right now, coming up on 46 minutes, 10 seconds before launch. Didn't hear any significant chatter coming over countdown one. Yes, launch director into countdown net. Pull is complete, and we have a go to proceed with propellant load. Launch control, proceed with swing into crew arm. Arming crew arm movement for T minus 45 minutes. Thank you, launch control. A reminder in control room on hold and launch escape protocol for non-urgent no-go conditions, brief CE or LD, and it will approve aborting the launch auto sequence and proceed to launch abort. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence. Operators shall also advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. Remainder on fire alarm instructions here in fire room four, event of a fire alarm, key operators, previously briefed, will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personal safety is threatened, we will evacuate to the south facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. One final reminder, we'll be arming the launch escape system momentarily. Need all personnel, please stay in your seats from now through orbit insertion and dragon separation from the second stage. Rear access arm retract has started. And you've heard Mike Taylor, the SpaceX launch director, give instructions to the team. We've also just heard the call. The crew access arm retraction is underway. Great view from the camera inside the white room. As we see the arm moving away from the Dragon capsule, one of the major events necessary to get down to T0. The next one coming up will be arming of the escape system on the Dragon capsule. Now, right now, the next plan for Falcon 9, T minus 35 minutes, we will begin loading propellant onto the first and second stages. Now, currently, Falcon 9's looking good. Dragon's looking good. The range continues to be go for launch in terms of the clearance around the uh, launch pad, both the air and the sea space. Looking at the flight corridor, the ground stations, uh, the NASA tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support and we just continue to monitor the weather. 
Uh, our team is getting constant updates. We're monitoring uh, weather uh, data sensors around the launch site, looking to make sure that we can get everything into the green position. The one that we're mostly looking at right now is how much rain we're going to get between now and liftoff, uh, whether it's just going to be mild precipitation that's within the uh, rules for loading propellant. Uh, that's what the expectation is, but we're going to continue to watch that. So fingers crossed, but right now coming up at uh, T minus 43 minutes, 18 seconds and counting, everything but the weather's go and the weather is trending in the right direction. So we've got our fingers crossed here. At this time, we're going to send it back over to Kennedy Space Center as the action is picking up on the launch pad. Thanks, John I. Now that countdown clock is continuing to tick and we are 42 minutes and 46 seconds away from launch. Now, as you just saw, the crew arm retracted. That is the last major visual milestone before liftoff. And we should be hearing out on the net soon confirmation that the launch escape system is armed. When that happens, all eight of the Super Draco throttle valves are opened, which means that those engines can ignite. For section seven. Okay. So that means those, thro those uh, eight uh, throttle valves are opened, and if those Super Dracos needed to fire in order for a dragon to escape off of the pad, they could. And so things running just a little bit ahead of schedule right now. Field lead is complete. Now we just saw the crew access arm track just a minute ago. We saw NASA astronauts Doug Hurley. In uh, seven decimal two, our visors are closed and we're arming the launch escape system. So we just heard the astronauts confirm that they are about to launch, or excuse me, arm the launch escape system. That happens just before fueling begins, which we expect to happen in just a couple of minutes. We saw Bob and Doug suit up a little over three hours ago. Then we watched them drive out to Launch Complex 39A. They were assisted by the SpaceX ground team with Crew Dragon Ingress. That happened a little before 2 o'clock this afternoon. And then we saw the spacecraft hatch close. And again, just a minute ago, we saw the crew access arm retract. We just heard that the crew armed the launch escape system. And in just a few minutes, we are going to uh, hear the call that they have started propellant loading. Launch escape system is verified armed. So we just heard that verification that the launch escape system is armed. We're switching to GN2. And we are going to send it over to Hawthorne uh, to take us through prop loading. Jesse? From the parachutes to the launch escape system, SpaceX has de designed Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 to be the safest vehicle, launch vehicle ever flown. And joining us today, we have SpaceX's Nick Pacone, who was our mission manager for our in-flight abort uh, mission earlier this year and currently works on the Starlink team. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Hey, Jesse. I'm here at the Launch and Landing Recovery Center with the recovery team and our Dragon Ground Operations team monitoring the launch. Awesome. Can you tell us more about the critical safety features on this new version of Dragon? Sure. So Dragon 2 was designed with long-term reuse and reliability in mind. So fundamentally, there are multiple layers of redundancy to any of the failure modes that, that we could conceive of, that NASA could conceive of uh, when we were working to design and test this vehicle over the past few years. But in the event that we encounter an unforeseen failure mode or multiple failures which push us outside of our design space, Dragon also has backup systems and operational controls intended to keep Bob and Doug safe. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it today, but the launch escape system is primar the primary uh, backup system that we have from the moment that the vehicle is here on that being fueled uh, all the way up until orbital insertion. Um, at a high level, uh, the launch escape system in the event of a major Falcon anomaly or emergency 
will terminate Falcon Thrust, separate Dragon from Falcon, and it'll use Dragon's eight Super Draco engines to quickly pull the vehicle away from any kind of Falcon anomaly. And you talked a lot about the launch escape system. How exactly is that activated? Is it autonomous? Is it manually activated? Definitely. So for this system to work as designed, you have to remember that the vehicle could be flying at hundreds or thousands of miles an hour through the lower atmosphere. So it's really important that it's a extremely fast and highly reliable with very low chance of false positives. Uh, the launch escape system fundamentally is set to look at a set of pre-programmed criteria which are on board the vehicle. Dragon and Falcon are looking at high rate telemetry, um, looking for abnormal vehicle dynamics, loss of communication between critical systems, um, or manual commanding. Our launch director and chief engineer, who you've heard a lot from today, are capable of sending a manual command uh, to Dragon to initiate a launch escape. And Bob and Doug are also always able to, uh, to actuate the launch escape handle and, and initiate a launch escape themselves as well. Um, now that the system is armed, um, all of this is currently active on the vehicle. Wow, it sounds like there's a lot that goes into it. And we did have an in-flight abort test earlier this year to test this out. Can you tell us what we learned from that test? Definitely. Uh, it was possibly the, the most flight-like test of an orbital class booster um, in history. Uh, it was a fully flight-like test using a full Falcon 9 rocket, which we had to knowingly destroy um, in order to get this fully integrated system. Um, for folks who didn't get a chance to see it, uh, the vehicle followed a normal crew launch trajectory about a minute and a half into flight. Uh, we had Dragon autonomously trigger the launch escape system based on a, a reconfiguration of those triggers I was just talking about. Um, and load. thankfully we had... Uh, we, uh, we continued through flight, um, had a successful parachute deployment and splashdown, um, and we did see Falcon rather spectacularly blow up um, about 10 seconds after separation. Um, it's uh, important to recognize that all of that happens uh, from command to actual separation of the vehicle in under half a second. Wow, yeah, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining us and talking through those details with us. Enjoy the launch today. So we're gonna send it back to KSC with Lauren. Thank you, Jesse. We are about a minute and a half away from propellant load. At T minus 35 minutes, we should hear the call out on the nets that propellant load has started. So that's about a minute and 13 seconds away. Hi, hey, Marie and Lauren. I am getting goosebumps over here. This is uh, an exciting moment. Uh, when I was sitting in the vehicle, when we retracted everything, when all the load, the prop was getting loaded up, I was just uh, going through my crew notebook. I was thinking about, you know, what my first step would be if there was a malfunction, because usually everything goes nominally when you fly to space, but you have to think about the things that you have to take care of, you know, the first steps you have to take care of. And on my mission, I was calling out the ab abort calls, like if we had lost an engine, where would we go next, when the different abort calls around the country and around the world. So I think that's what those guys are probably thinking about now, and uh, just really getting ready for this, this mission to go, go off. Absolutely, and we're just now about 20 seconds from when we expect propellant loading to start. Again, that's fueling of the rocket. All right, we're getting close. We should hear that call out any second now on the nets, so let's listen in. Propellant load has started. Fantastic. So prop load has started. We've started loading liquid oxygen on stage one and stage two. Um, and yeah, liquid oxygen and RP1, which is our rocket grade kerosene. So now that we are 34 minutes and 42 seconds away from the first launch of astronauts into orbit from American soil since 2011, we know that the launch escape system is armed, which happened just before fueling. Dragon prop load happened weeks ago, actually just a few miles, miles down the road at what we call Dragon Land. And those propellants, which are MMH or monomethyl hydrogen, that's our fuel, and NTO, or nitrogen tetraoxide, that's our oxidizer, uh, those not only feed the Draco engines that propel Dragon on orbit, but they also supply those eight super, eight super Draco engines of the launch escape system. So I have one right here, a little model. Um, 
oh, it doesn't come off the stand. <laughs> Don't break it, Lauren. All right, I, I know, it's very nice. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we, the Dragon is actually broken up into four quads, and each quad has two of the Super Draco engines for a total of eight of them. And as I mentioned, they are uh, biprop engines. They have MMH and NTO as their oxidizer. Um, now, most abort systems from past space vehicles, uh, I believe like Soyuz, Mercury, Apollo, they all had an, a pointy escape tower on top where there was essentially like a mini rocket engine or a series of rocket engines on top. And if they weren't used, those that that escape tower would have to jettison itself from the vehicle. If it was used, it would be used to lift the vehicle off of the rocket. Well, Dragon is a little bit different in that its escape system is actually integrated into the vehicle. And that's great for a couple of reasons. One, uh, one less thing you have to jettison on a nominal flight. Right. Um, and so they're pretty dormant, just those throttle valves open unless they're used and hopefully they never have to be. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other thing that that offers you is the ability to escape from the pad all the way to orbit. Right. Because if you jettisoned your escape system prior to that, you couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's a little drag in there. Again, right. new era, much safer design. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Thanks for walking us through that, Lauren. Again, the launch escape system is armed. Um, that protects Bob and Doug so that if something were to go wrong, they can shoot off of the pad away from the rocket and parachute to safety in the ocean. Um, that is such a crucial safety capability. And so now we want to go over to Hawthorne for an operational update with John. Thanks, Murray. We are counting down those final minutes. Everything is still looking good on the Falcon 9 and the Dragon vehicles for an on-time launch. But weather is trending the wrong way right now. We're keeping our ears open in case we hear that uh, the weather is going to be no go for the rest of the count. Right now, we are counting down at T minus 32 minutes. Stage one locks Falcon and Falcon 9 did begin propellant nominal. load at T minus 35 minutes, right on time. The propellants we use on Falcon 9 are a fuel, which is rocket grade kerosene, also called RP1, refined petroleum. We use an oxidizer, and that's the super chill liquid oxygen, or LOX as we call it. Those two propellants with, you know, come together, but they don't light, so we need an ignition source to complete the fire triangle. For this, Falcon 9 uses a fluid called T-TEB. You might see that just before first stage ignition or maybe later in the second stage ignition. You get a green colored flame as the T-TEB comes out into the oxygen, and that ignites the main engines right before the rocket takes off or the second stage engine lights. Now currently in the fueling, RP-1 fuel is about 10% full on the first stage. That's the bottom two-thirds of the stack of the vehicle you can see on the left. The first stage is that long white cylinder at the bottom plus that black cylinder called the inner stage. That's the entire first stage that we're loading with LOX and RP-1 kerosene. That's the part that comes back to Earth. The second stage just above it, the white cylinder, and then above that will be the Dragon trunk and the capsule. Now currently, the second stage is also loading fuel with RP-1. That's about 8% uh, full right now. We are loading liquid oxygen on the first stage. The second stage liquid oxygen load will begin at T minus 16 and a half minutes if the weather cooperates. So LOX loading will then continue on both the first and second stage until the last few minutes of the countdown. Helium loading is also underway into pressure vessels on the first, second stage. We use that to pressurize the tanks in flight as the propellant is being pulled out by the Merlin turbo pumps. Dragon on board the spacecraft. You can see the astronauts are monitoring systems while propellant is loaded into the Falcon 9. Now when we Stage flew one, cryo, the first started. demo flight last year and then the in-flight escape test earlier this year, the sounds inside the Dragon capsule were recorded. So as part of the training, the sounds of the propellant loading were played back to acclimate the crew to what they're experiencing now. I'm stopping, I'm listening to some discussion on one of the back nets, uh, trying to track uh, where we are with the weather criteria. Uh, we're just passing another weather gate right now, uh, trying to see whether or not the conditions are go. Uh, in certain situations, when the weather is no go, you have to wait 30 minutes, and we are now inside of 30 minutes. But if the cloud moves away, if the conditions improve, uh, we may be able to continue the countdown for another 14 minutes and reassess. So we're waiting to see whether or not uh, we can continue the count. Currently we are. 
the range, they're ready to support with no problems uh, in the air and the sea space area. Uh, but again, the weather, that's the one that's looking bad and we're gonna continue to listen. And as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we're going to have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity on May 30th. For demo two, Bob and Doug's flight to station will take about 19 hours and their journey is fairly similar to the trip our cargo dragon makes back and forth to the International Space Station with two noticeable differences, docking and splashdown. As we await T minus zero in just a little over 28 minutes from now, ground operations teams just doing those final series of system checks, making sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for liftoff and really keeping an eye on that weather. And you're just continuing to get live views of the teams. You've got Falcon 9 and Dragon on your left and then Bob and Doug on the right as they prepare at the Cape for liftoff. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon make their ascent until Falcon 9 and first and second stages separate and send Dragon on its way to the space station. And once it gets on orbit, mission operators will prepare Dragon for on-orbit operations, where Dragon will execute a series of burns that are going to gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the International Space Station. And you're seeing some of that track in the animation on your screen right now. After doing enough of Dragon, those burns, SpaceX they'll put Dragon. Oh, sounds like we're going to get a weather update real quick for the crew. Go ahead, SpaceX. Yeah, we're currently just evaluating uh, one constraint, a constraint on the field mill rule, which looks at lightning energy dissipation. Um, we expect to have an update at about T minus 20, and uh, more information there on whether we would be able to continue into the prop load or, or scrub at that time. Okay, Jay, thanks for the update. We appreciate it. Copy. So I'll give you some more words in about six minutes. Okay, so it sounds like we're going to find cap. out in about six minutes if we're going to have enough time. And John, I was referring to a couple of those weather situations where we have to have a, a certain amount of time. In this case, uh, with the field mills, about 15 minutes. So they have until about 16 minutes and 30 seconds to really make sure that we're going to have enough time for that to dissipate. So we're going to be listening for that weather update in just a couple of minutes. But it is going to be a pretty interesting trip uphill for them once they actually get on orbit. <laughs> And a very exciting countdown with six minutes to figure out if we are launching today. But t targeting back to what we were talking about, next, will Dragon will make its approach and actually dock with the space station. This is a very different process from what we've seen with Dragon cargo deliveries in the past, which used a process called berthing. Now, berthing requires a spacecraft to approach the station and then stop so a crew member can maneuver the station's robotic arm to capture the spacecraft. Docking on this version of Dragon can be done autonomously. Stage two cryohelium load started. Autonomously with no crew aboard the station. It's typically a faster process, both when arriving and leaving, but it does still require pinpoint accuracy to approach safely. Once captured, a spacecraft then gets attached to a common berthing mechanism. It's the same type of port that we use to connect each of the modules together on board station. It's a little bit slower process than docking, but the hatches are significantly larger than docking ports, which makes them perfect for bringing up large cargo items. Dragon will spend up to 120 days docked before preparing to return home. Following successful completion of Dragon's test objectives and cargo loading operations, the crew will close out the cabin, perform final system checks, and configure the vehicle for undocking. Once the automated undocking sequence is complete, Dragon will complete two departure burns using its Draco engines, pushing it away from the space station. And then after Dragon departs the station, it's ready for its trip home and that'll have deorbit entry and landing and a number, number of other operations. If you're looking at this animation, it might look like we're playing the one we played originally in reverse, because that's kind of how it goes, but just a little bit quicker. Uh, all of the operations following the final departure maneuver will include things like trunk separation, closing that nose cone again, executing a deorbit burn, and once they're inside the atmosphere, deploying drogue and then main parachutes, and then finally splashing down off the Florida coast, at which team time teams will move in, 
get Bob and Doug up out of the water and get them out of the capsule once they're on the boat. So we have four minutes now until we get that next expected weather update. Let's go down now to the team at Kennedy. Murray. All right, thanks, Dan. If you're just joining us, we are now T minus 23 minutes and 48 seconds from the first launch of astronauts to the International Space Station from U.S. soil in nine years. We're going to find out in less than four minutes if the weather looks good for that. Um, and this will mark the beginning of a new era where more people will be able to fly to space than ever before. Um, in fact, we took a poll a little bit earlier to ask you if you had the opportunity to fly to space, would you go? And 86% of those of you watching answered that you would go to space. That's an incredible number. I think, you know, realizing that you don't have to be a military astronaut or a NASA astronaut to fly in space. You can be a regular civil, you know, just a regular person going off to space on a SpaceX type rocket. So I think that's why the numbers are so high. Yeah, and, and we are really thrilled to uh, to see all the folks uh, watching along online. I know we certainly hope that uh, that this is a go, but we're again, we're going to hear a little bit of a weather update in less than three minutes now. And Leland, you know, I know they're waiting for a weather update and they've come, you know, almost all the way down the count. What do you think Bob and Doug are thinking about right now? You know, we uh, on 120, SES 129, we were having some weather problems and I think we were getting close to the countdown and then it seemed like the sky just cleared up right above our heads. We saw it and we knew where we were going and you know we always know that you know you can have any types of delays, fuel prop delays, all kinds of things that can happen but we've trained over and over and over again for these types of scenarios and so you know we want to be safe, we want to be safe for our families and uh, we'll you know do this another day if it doesn't work with the weather. I love that John I always says weather. It's that thing that everybody talks about, but no one can do anything about it. <laughs> I know. And it is this interesting thing of just, you know, succumbing to, right. to Mother Earth. She's going to tell us if we can go or not today. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, if it happens, I mean, look at it this way. Bob and Doug got one really great rehearsal in, right? <laughs> it's always best to practice and practice and practice, yes. So again, we're less than two minutes now from that weather update that uh, is going to go directly to Bob and Doug, and we will quiet down so we can listen in for that because I know we can't wait to find out what that is. And uh, those of you watching that have been following along, um, we are eagerly awaiting to hear um, whether the weather is going to be a showstopper today. These clouds can seem really deceiving at times, right? You see the blue skies peeking through and you think everything's fine, but you just don't know. That's Absolutely. why we have those launch weather officers. Absolutely. And I know, you know, we've talked about it before, but it's not just the weather in Florida that they're looking at. They've got to look at weather downrange. If they, if they were to have an abort um, in flight and they needed to come down somewhere in the, in the ocean, uh, they need to consider what the weather's like out there because recovery teams have to go out and get them in a situation like that. So there's so many variables, um, and that's why um, not just with this flight, but you know, with every human space flight we've had in the past, there's always a very good chance of of a scrub because because you do have so much criteria that you have to meet. And we're going to listen in now. We're just seconds away from a weather update. Stage two RP1 load complete. That is liquid oxygen you see venting off the rocket. That's completely normal and expected. We're standing by for a weather update. Um, unless you can give us another uh, 10 minutes, I don't think we're going to get there uh, with any of the rules today. I'm mean, going to give you 10 minutes. I mean, <laughs> another 10 minutes past T0. Oh, 1640, that, 1645 local, I think we would probably be clear on all the rules, but uh, uh, not quite, not quite going to make it for this. Okay. We're going to check back in with you in about two minutes, and then I'll call it up at about uh, T minus 17 minutes. Okay. Yeah, we got, we, there's, some of them are starting to count down, but we still have one above 2,000. So if that gets below, uh, out. 
Man, that didn't sound great right there. That was the weather net going out, but we're still standing by for a final decision. And we're going to continue to listen in for an update. But in the meantime, we're going to go over to John Innsbrucker at SpaceX headquarters in California. John? And Dragon SpaceX on weather. Uh, we're still T not minus 18 good minutes currently. and counting. Uh, LD is, we uh, are still, still red on weather. Uh, expect an update from LD. We're waiting in about uh, another in minute for one final check with weather. We're going to check at okay, T minus 17 copy. minutes, possibly. We don't really expect that things will have improved. Uh, the weather officer was not optimistic that uh, the weather would clear up that rapidly. We did hear the launch director, Mike T Taylor, joke that, you know, if we uh, could move uh, 10 more minutes uh, past the T0, weather conditions may improve. But Mike was not able to do that. We have an instantaneous window today. So at 17 minutes, we want to make that call because shortly after that, we will begin loading liquid oxygen onto the second stage. So if we're not going to have the opportunity to launch, launch if the clock's going to run out, that, stand by. We continue to violate a couple different weather rules that we now do not expect to clear in time to allow for a launch today. We go ahead and end uh, today's launch attempt. Launch control. Go ahead and end the launch auto sequence and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence, please. Launch board has started. And Dragon SpaceX, unfortunately, um, we are not going to launch today. You are go for 5.100 launch scrub. 5.100, it was a good effort by the teams and we understand and we'll uh, meet you there. Copy all. We've heard the call from the crew. They have been informed. Launch Director Mike Taylor uh, has called a scrub for the day, and we got the feedback when uh, the Dragon team informed uh, Bob and Doug. They said we gave it a good try, what they understand, and uh, we are here to try another day. So right now we did uh, officially hold the clock. It looks like at T minus 16 minutes, 54 seconds. The launch automatic sequence that controls the Falcon 9, the loading of propellants, the cycling of valves, that is also stopped. We now proceed into what is a normal scrub sequence for us. We practice this every launch. So now we move into safely taking the propellants, the pressurization gases back off the first and second stages. As things get into a safe configuration, then we will uh, disarm the escape system on Dragon, and we'll bring the crew access arm back around the uh, spacecraft. So right now, we got down to just inside 17 minutes. The hardware was working very well on both Dragon and spacecraft. We had the uh, fuel loading going on. We had liquid oxygen loading going on, everything but the second stage. And the weather just needed a little bit more time to clear the conditions. We didn't have that time because we had an instantaneous window. And so with that, SpaceX launch director had to call upon the input from okay, weather. Dragon copies had to call all about 30 minutes. Thank for you, the day per the safety rules that we have for this flight. So right now the team is undergoing the uh, post scrub operations on both Dragon uh, as well as Falcon 9 working with the range. No issues being reported right now as we start to go through that sequence. Everything looks good. And uh, Dan, uh, <laughs> We had a we had a good uh, webcast going here until the very end. So uh, you know we'll look at it as uh, now we've had another great uh, dry rehearsal. Last Saturday we did a dry one, I should say, and today we've done a wet dress rehearsal. But sorry, we just couldn't get there, Dan. Yeah, thanks, John. I and obviously we can't control the weather. We came right down to the wire there, hoping we could just squeeze in between those cloud systems to get a launch today, but. It wasn't to be, um, but 
It doesn't mean this we're done. We're going to have another attempt coming up in just three days. So we're going to be doing this all over again, essentially on Saturday uh, on the 30th. And that launch attempt is going to be coming at 322 p.m. Eastern time. So a little bit earlier in the day, it's going to look largely the same to everything that we saw today with the crew waking up, going through suit up, making their way to the pad. So it's gonna, we're gonna feel a lot of deja vu, I think, on Saturday. Yep. Um, but still exciting. Um, safety is always first. So if weather was not there for us today, hopefully Saturday it will be there for us and we will have a safe launch on Saturday. Yeah, the initial weather report still had us at about, I think, a 40% uh, possibility of violation. So weather a little bit better, but we're still going to be kind of rolling the dice. It is Florida in the spring and summer, so storms are always a possibility. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, one of the good things, though, the vehicle appeared to be in great health throughout the day, both Dragon and Falcon 9, so we didn't have to scrub for any technical issue. We're going to continue and follow along with Bob and Doug until they're out of that capsule, as, again, they had started loading fuel onto the Falcon 9 rocket, so they'll have to wait until all that fuel comes off. They'll disarm the launch escape system, which still stays armed because they're still sitting on a partially loaded rocket, and then once they're able to disarm that launch escape system, the crew arm will swing back out, They'll make their way once again back the way they came, and then we'll be back to crew quarters for Bob and Doug for a few more days. But if you're just now tuning in, wondering why we're not still counting down, we did have a launch scrub today. We were just a little under Stage 17 one minutes. And fuel flow rates are nominal for offload. Expecting about a 40 minute offload time. And so that call out the, the locks, the liquid oxygen fuel pumping out of the first stage of the Falcon 9, everything looking good with that. Expecting about 40 minutes for all that fuel to come off. So again, once that fuel comes off, Bob and Doug will be able to disarm the launch escape system and that crew access arm will swing back out. And they'll be able to make their way back down and then over to crew quarters. So. Unfortunate scrub today because of weather. That was the one thing we were tracking from the moment we started today, uh, watching Bob and Doug get suited up for their launch. Uh, we did abort today's launch or scrub today's launch uh, with a little under 17 minutes to go until our T0 time, which was 4.33. So that's going to move us to our next attempt, which is coming up on Saturday. And that time is going to be uh, 3.22 p.m. Eastern time, so a little bit early earlier in the day for Bob and Doug and for everybody else watching around the world. They're still gonna have a 19 hour flight to station if that's when we launch. And a lot of the stuff that we saw today is gonna look very similar, but we're just gonna have to try again, cross our fingers, hope for a little bit weather, better weather the next <laughs> time. And again, this goes with every launch. We do track everything all the way down to T0 to make sure that everything is go, making sure that the range is go, weather is go. So this is standard procedure. Um, we always tend to make sure that we have a backup day, launch day, in case we do yep. have scrubs like today. So this is, this is pretty normal and standard. Um, nothing to be worried about. Again, we do this for the safety of our vehicles as well as today we had astronauts on our vehicle. So even bigger reason for us to make sure that we have safe weather for them to fly. And just a reminder for everyone still tuned in, it takes about 40 minutes for all of this propellant to come off of the Falcon 9. And while it is offloading that launch escape system on Dragon, which is designed to pull the capsule away, if there's any issue with the rocket or anything on the pad, that is still armed. So we're gonna continue to stay with this until all the propellants off, and then we'll see the launch escape system get disarmed. Bob and Doug will be able to open up their visors again. The launch, uh, the crew access arm will swing back out and link up with Dragon and they'll make their way off and then down the uh, tower at the pad. But if you're just now tuning in, no launch today. We did have to scrub because of weather. We're gonna be moving to our second attempt on Saturday, just a little bit earlier in the afternoon. Just gonna to continue to stand by as this propellant comes off. We heard a call that everything was going nominally or as expected so far. And then once the, all the propellants off, we should see Bob and Doug make their way out of Dragon shortly after.
And what you're seeing on your screen is a live view of Bob and Doug on the right side inside of Dragon as they're waiting for propellant to be removed from the vehicle so that it is safe for them to disarm the launch escape system. And this will take uh, a bit of time. So we are going to stay live with you to watch this uh, as they exit the vehicle eventually um, and come down from, from standing down on launch today. Up until the point of the scrub, we had a really clean countdown, weren't tracking any issues with Falcon 9 or the Dragon spacecraft, so always a good thing to see. We did have to scrub because of that weather. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, we were still in violation of one of the weather criteria. It was the strength of electric fields in the atmosphere that uh, the 45th Space Wing and other weather operators are monitoring around the launch pad. And that's one of those rules where we need a certain amount of time if we're in a violation in this case. Nominal, roughly 50% on stage one locks and fuel, 85% on stage two fuel. So the propellant offload on Falcon 9 continuing to go well. Uh, but we needed a little bit more time if we were going to be able to clear that launch weather constraint. And since we do have an instantaneous launch window today, we weren't able to make it. So we hope for better weather coming up on Saturday, where again, our next launch attempt is going to be 